Welcome. My name is Gina Timberman, and you are listening to Timber People, a podcast about people who, like Timber, are strong, build and create, who gather us together like fuel that feeds fire. People who support structures of our community that uplift and protect. Hello, I'm really happy to welcome my friend and associate, uh, John Satterfield, who is the Director of Regulatory Affairs, as well as an environmental uh, geological scientist. And I can't wait to kind of dive into some great conversation with you. Thank you and welcome. Well, yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation with you. Yakoki. Uh, um, John is Choctaw, which I'm really excited to talk about that. And, you know, we were just talking just now about, you know, with the array of job opportunities that are out there related to STEM programs, geological sciences, um, and what's happening environmentally, but also with the energy industry, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy to be engaged with work with John, but I'm also really excited about Native people and others to learn about the type of work that you do. Well, I'm, I'm an open book. And so uh, if you want to if you want to ask me questions, I'm going to tell you um, the way I the way I think about it and the way I see it and, and my opinion. Um, but I, I, I think you're you're spot on that we're we're in the middle of this transition, both globally and nationally and even here in Oklahoma, where the way we have done things in the past uh, we are rethinking those things. And I'm not necessarily talking about recycling your waste or right. your plastics or or buying an electric vehicle or you know growing growing your your own vegetables in your backyard or raising your own chickens. Um, all of those things are part of that. but at the, at, but at its core is is we've we understand that we have an impact to the environment um, and the world as individuals and collectively. Um, and, and so I think that realization, coupled with um, the traditional thought processes, religions of, of Native Americans, are kind of, a, kind of coming together um, because how important water and earth and air are have traditionally been with, with tribes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and same thing here with the, the non-Native um, realization that, my gosh, you know what, me sitting in traffic— and by engine running for two and a half hours right. on my commute to and from work has an impact. Mm-hmm. It individually it might be small, but I'm just one car of thousands on this highway, right. all doing the same thing. And so how can we individually make changes to the way we do things incrementally over time so that we can provide uh, positive impacts to the environment or uh, conversely, decrease our negative impacts to the environment. And so I'm a, I'm an environmental scientist by degree. Um, I've done environmental science related things my entire career. Uh, I like to fish. I like to hunt. Um, don't have much chance to do any of those things anymore because I've got younger children, uh, <laughs> which means soccer and volleyball and horseback riding and things like that. But um, at the end of the day, I, I like to be on the back porch and maybe have a cold beverage with my wife in, mm-hmm. in the evenings and enjoy our backyard and, and the birds and things like that. And so um, as an environmental scientist, uh, and my career spans from hazardous waste sites, and um, I did work in China, uh, and, and, and I worked for a long time with the oil and gas industry. I'm a very pro-oil and gas person. We, we like oil and gas. We need oil and gas. But I also realized that there's opportunities to improve. And so um, the opportunities with our project are really unique in that all of the things I've done my entire career over 30 years, I'm able to use something new that's emerging. Mm-hmm. Um, again, that takes into account the how can I as an individual or collectively reduce um, impacts to the environment. And so regardless of whether uh, you believe global climate change is occurring um, and I'm of the mind that it is. Right. Uh, and regardless of how much impact you believe humans may have on the environment or global climate change, 
I'm of the mind that we do have impact. Um, we get back to my analogy I had a minute ago about I'm sitting in my car in traffic on I-44 here in Oklahoma City, and I'm one of thousands of cars just sitting there. I'm not getting anywhere fast. I'm just spitting out pollution in right. the environment. So how can I minimize my impact or decrease my negative impact? Um, and so our project is focused on scaling up what is called carbon capture and sequestration, mm -hmm. CCS. I've attended conferences for the last 20 years where there would be lots of really smart PhD engineers, multiple letters behind their names, talk about sequestration of carbon dioxide underground, the capture of it, the transportation of it, and all the science around how that could work. And um, since the 1970s, uh, CCS has been it has been in, in uh, practice has been in use, um, but it's been more on the oil and gas side mm -hmm. in in recovering more oil and gas from depleted fields. Again, I drive a car that runs on gasoline. Right. right. I have which, a house, which really most of us do. <laughs> I have a house that runs on that that has natural gas fired uh, furnaces and water heaters, um, and, and so, uh, but but. Um, the, the discussions I was just describing at these conferences, um, there's been incremental improvements over time and, and projects, some of which have succeeded, some of which have failed. But um, where, where those have failed, uh, I believe we have come up with a low-hanging fruit approach to bypass those failures and really demonstrate at scale what CCS can achieve for lots of industries in this country. And so, in a nutshell, uh, the company I work for uh, has a project in the upper Midwest where ethanol is being produced. Ethanol mm -hmm. is, is uh, you're taking um, plants, you're mashing them up, you're adding some water and some heat, and you're throwing yeast in there like you would if, you ever, if you've ever done homebrew or if you've ever baked bread, you use yeast to help either rise the, right. the, the, uh, the loaf or you use yeast, and that creates the alcohol in the wine or in the right. beer. And it actually creates CO2, carbon dioxide, as a byproduct. The yeast eats the sugars in the grapes or in the, uh, the hops or in the, uh, the corn, in the case of ethanol, and it produces three things. It produces about three pounds of corn will produce about a pound of ethanol that's, and a pound of what's called dried distiller grains. That's the the proteins and solids that the, the yeast can't eat, and it'll produce about a pound of CO2. Those are the three things that happen in the fermentation and production of, of ethanol. Um, and that ethanol can be used for fuel source. It can right. be used to make nice vodka and, right. and bourbon and right. things like that. And so that ethanol um, today is blended with gasoline, and it has a it creates lower emissions from that gasoline, it offsets some of those, those emissions just out of the tailpipe itself. Here in Oklahoma, we have E10 and E15 blends. There's actually E85 blends where it's 85% ethanol, 15% gasoline, traditional or conventional gasoline. And so um, that that is an endpoint use of that ethanol that's that's good for the for the environment, in my opinion. You got the secondary source, the DDG or secondary product, which is DDGs, dried distiller grains, and those are used for hog feed, primarily. And then you have the the CO two, and that's just emitted to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Our project will capture that CO two, it'll compress it, it will put it into a pipeline, and it'll transport that to uh, to North Dakota for sequestration in underground geology that's suitable for this. Uh, the the scope and scale is there's five states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, and Minnesota. There's 32 different ethanol plants with whom we've partnered. And there's going to be about 2,000 miles of pipelines that are going to uh, take the CO2 at each one of those ethanol plants and transport it up to North Dakota for that sequestration mm -hmm. site. Um, these are pumps. These are pipelines. These are compressors. Um, some of the, the more detailed equipment, like the valves and things like that, all of these things have been used by the oil and gas industry for decades. Right. There's no rocket science here relative to some black box that was designed in the last year or two right. that we're going to use. 
Um, and so people like me who've worked in the oil and gas industry for a long time and believe in it, there's a transition that we can make into something like this, where all the skills that we've, that we've received and, and trained on and all of our experiences on how not to do things the right way, if we know how to, if you're like me, you've been doing this a long time, you've done it the wrong way enough times to know how, what you right, shouldn't do, right. which is almost equally as important as knowing the right way of doing things. So, you know, if I may, I'd like to uh, jump in here mm -hmm. and interject that, you know, it's been a learning experience for me, the education about the technology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really respect the fact that, you know, as Native people, we've always been progressive people or we wouldn't have, you know, wood hinge, mound building, mm -hmm. um, you know, the way we look at star charts. Mm -hmm. And so I love the fact that we're looking at technologies that for better or for worse have, um, you know, historically been implemented. And there are a lot of also um, triggering words associated with projects. And there have been a lot of bad actors. Mm -hmm. But what I really appreciate is the opportunity to learn about ways in which we can progress beyond negative experiences to positively impact the environment. And so it's been a learning experience as I have been involved in this project to really um, <laughs> begin to, at the surface level. I'm, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I really appreciate the great minds that help, <laughs> like yours, that help explain things to me about how the science works and what the opportunities are. I mean, environmentally, we talk about, you know, this is this project has been positioned as an energy project for so long, mm -hmm. and it is in, you know, um, but also it's an environmental project. And that was really meaningful for me to understand what the safety opportunities were, you know, transporting something and also um, what the environmental impacts when you talk about taking millions of cars off the road, mm -hmm. you know, you use that example of, you know, sitting in traffic. Um, and, and we all like to hear about job creation. We all like to hear about economy, workforce development. But, you know, as a Native person, it's really important to respect and have the responsibilities for the environment. And uh, could you talk a little bit about what that means sure. for a project that Summit Carbon Solutions is doing today? Sure. So, um, as I mentioned a, a minute ago, we're, we're in the upper Midwest, and there's been a history of— linear infrastructure pro projects, I'll use the P word, the pipeline projects right. in that part of the world where um, interactions and interfaces with Native Americans has not been optimal, been right. very suboptimal. Uh, it's been contentious and 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 uh, in some instances very bad. It's been, yeah. Um, and so uh, one of the first things that we did whenever um, we started the project back in June of 2021 was so who are our stakeholders in the upper Midwest? And um, it wasn't very difficult to come up to the conclusion that we needed to do outreach with the tribes. Right. And so there's 62 different tribes, Lakotas, uh, Sioux tribes, uh, that and, and lots of you others. You have Oklahoma tribes Oklahoma that have a tribes, historic, you know, cultural historic, you know, through Ushayan. different removal, migration in ancient times and, you know, more recent times in the big picture have had, you know, they've been, you know, through those areas and have, you know, a historic cultural tie in some way or another to those areas. And so we, we did outreach. We, we identified 62 different tribes mm -hmm. who had some sort of connection historically, religiously, culturally, um, uh, and made sure that uh, we, re we reached out to them and said, hi, we're Summit Carbon Solutions. Here's our project. Here's where we think our footprint's going to be. Uh, we want to make sure that you know what we're planning on doing so that we can do a couple of things. One is start the conversation. We realize that we're not at a government. We're just a company and you are sovereign nations. Right. But um, we're going to we're going to go ahead and start the conversation today because from a process perspective, the federal government does this consultation process with each one of the tribes uh, and they've got their step by step thing to do. So that's great. We're going to participate with that as well. We're going to work with the United States government. 
the Corps of Engineers, um, but we're going to start the conversation ourselves as well because um, sometimes things can get lost in translation. Mm -hmm. um, with, you know, if you've ever played, little, little kid played post office right. where you'd sit in a slide <laughs> and you first right. push up somebody's ear. And, <laughs> and so having that direct, com at, least, at least opening the door and offering to have that direct conversation with each one of the tribes um, was, was our intent. Um, we have met with individual tribal members, um, or leadership, uh, both um, at at their at their uh, um, capitals, their headquarters, um, and, and council chambers. We've met with tribal leaders at conferences, uh, Tiro conferences, um, different regional conferences where tribes have come together for economic development opportunities and to talk about the project and form what's going on. Uh, and then, of course, we're working through the Corps of Engineers on the formal government-to-government -government consultation process. So from a, intersecting the tribes on here's our project, we would like your input, we would like to understand your concerns, uh, we want to make sure we mitigate those risks. Uh, we've, we've, we've started that process in August of 2021, so almost a year and a half, coming up on two years here at the end of the summer. Much earlier than you would have ever filed for your permits. So we didn't file. We, we didn't file for our permits until September of last year, 2022. So a full year before we ever filed right. our permits, and well before a typical interfacing with the tribes occurs under the normal circumstances for these kinds of projects. And so um, we we uh, have received um, some accolades for our approach. From my understanding, Summit Carbon Solutions is really creating a new standard in the engagement of tribal uh, leaders, tribes, tribal members in terms of, you know, requiring, you know, this is how we're going to conduct our business um, with respect and responsibility and, you know, really um, pursue 100 percent tribal surveys, yes. engage tribal monitors the tribal historic preservation offices, tribal employment rights offices. And so that level of, of due diligence and commitment to Indian country has really given me a great deal of confidence in, you know, working with a project like this. Well, and I, and I appreciate that, both um, understanding your background and your experiences and, and, and then what I've seen and experienced in my career um, whenever we interface with, with tribes. Um, I, this is, in my opinion, the new standard for how linear projects like this should occur. Um, and it's not to say that everyone want, likes the project because some people don't. Um, it's not that uh, um, we are going to agree with everybody because sometimes we don't. But at the end of the day, um, our understanding and recognition of the sovereignty of each one of these tribes and the tribal governments – uh, uh, non-native people tend to see someone who presents as Native American as representative of all Native Americans. Oh, right. And, and <laughs> so um, whenever I hear of a person who's Native American who is against the project, my first question is, what kind of leadership role do they serve in their tribe? Are they speaking for the tribe? Or are they speaking for themselves? Right. Because if, if a, an individual Native American's voice um, has some sort of weight. Well, I'm Native American, and I like the project, and here's why I think right. it's good. And so my my voice should be equal to their voice. Now, if they are the chairwoman of a tribe, and she says these things about the project, then she is speaking for the tribe, right. which is the government. And so I, I, it's not to diminish an individual's thoughts and feelings and, and concerns, but it is to place, in, in my opinion, some context around a, a Native American versus a sovereign nation. Right. And speaking about context, you know, we know that the Department of Interior has a climate action plan, uh, as well as Bureau of Land Management, mm -hmm. and a project like this fits um you know, very optimistically in plans that suit not only a national um, response to climate change, but also an international global um, response to climate change. Yes. So Secretary Allen um, has has uh, set that out as, as a, a goal and, and a mission for Department of Interior. Um, I believe our project fits well into that. I think from a um, an opportunity perspective for Indian country, from business opportunity. I think that 
that mission for the Department of Interior, for BIA, um, it, it fits well into what we're talking about relative to carbon capture and sequestration. There's unique situations, especially with the land-based tribes, um, where by owning the property, the, owning the reservation itself, as opposed to what we have here in Oklahoma where it's kind of scattershot, right. um, they are able to um, control what's going on, on on the top of their land. And from a just a pure legal perspective, the surface owner of a property owns the pore space. And so if the geology is correct underneath those reservations for sequestration, um, again, Unique opportunities for tribes when it comes to CCS, CCUS. What we have in our project is we're capturing CO2 from individual industrial sources. Right. Um, that here, would just be in the air. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So individual individual um, ethanol plants, um, you know, there's, there's projects, not ours, but there's projects that look at coal-fired power plants and other kinds of sources of CO2. Uh, but on, on the other side of that, in the CCS process or CCS world are, it's called direct air capture. And it's, it's the setting up of equipment that's pulling the CO2 directly from the atmosphere as opposed from a stack at an industrial right. source. And again, owning um, and having control uh, and their sovereignty of each one of those, uh, those tribal nations, those are opportunities there and funding that's, that's available through right. DOE, uh, through department of commerce, through um, other sources um, at the federal level, uh, that the, in my opinion, the tribes can take advantage of that. Again, from an environmental perspective, capturing CO2, helping to minimize, further minimize or reduce or even reverse the effects of global climate change. And having talked with lots of tribal leaders in the upper Midwest, it's not much different than down here, at least not this time, this time of year in Oklahoma is very wet, but, uh, there's, there's, uh, um, Rain, rain's not a big, not happening a whole lot up in the upper Midwest right, right. now. And so these tribes are suffering from drought conditions. Right. And, and so how can they step into this, again, with their unique positions as sovereign nations, having control over their own lands, that they can they can take advantage and step into this and, again, be part of the solution, in my opinion. Absolutely. And that's what sovereignty really is. You know, really making your own, you know, laws, your own mm -hmm. um, path forward and and ruling by that and, you know, putting it into a context again environmentally is really, you know, we talk about millions of cars being taken off the road, mm -hmm. the impact of, you know, 15 million acres of forest. Like that's that's huge. That's sure. not that's not small um, to talk about impact. We've talked a little bit about tribal participation and engagement, um, the number of tribes that have been contacted, uh, 36 tribal monitors, nine tribes mm -hmm. that have been actively engaged. I was really fortunate to be a part of one of the training programs oh, up at Mille Lacs. Wonderful, wonderful community. But the opportunities also from an economic development and Indian country perspective and job creation with opportunities for tribally and native-owned businesses and native individuals – um, I know we have plans for job fairs, workshops. We have a training going on next week. Mm -hmm. um, but also the investment in education, trade schools, scholarships, STEM programs, and curriculum development. Um, you know, I was telling you earlier that, you know, I really hope that, you know, young Native people or Native students that, you know, are really engaged in, you know, uh, science and, you know, with uh, – you know, with the opportunities that different programs can present, that they would uh, be uh, inspired to pursue a career that could further positively impact Indian country. Sure. So um, we kind of skipped over. Uh, I, I grew up most of my life here in Oklahoma uh, from second grade on Oklahoma City, northwest Oklahoma City. And um, my father uh, and mother from Stigler, Oklahoma, Haskell County. Oh, right. In eastern Oklahoma. My actually, my father's from Whitefield, Oklahoma, which is a suburb of Stigler. Right. <laughs> of about at the time, probably two hundred people, um, born at home, in fact. And uh, um, I ended up going to college, uh, finishing up my college at East Central University in mm -hmm. Ada, Oklahoma. Oh, right. They have environment. They had a, they have an environmental health science program. Then it was just environmental science, but 
a lot of the graduates actually ended up going into um, the IHS, I mean, health service. Mm-hmm. Um, some of my my uh, classmates have have moved through the ranks and been all over the country, up into Alaska and every place, uh, working for IHS on public health uh, issues and and working with the tribes to to solve solve problems that uh, are real problems for for tribes. Um, but uh, I chose a different route with my degree and, and went into to uh, environmental consulting. Um, but the, lots of lots of native kids were going to school there, and I trust are still going to school there, getting those degrees that are stepping into the IHS um, uh, ranks. But from a from an opportunity perspective in shifting people's lives, um, I think that in the upper Midwest, uh, this project and the unique situation both with the geology in North Dakota for our project and the unique opportunities with the tribes themselves, there are, there are things that um, we can do as the company I work for, Summit Carbon Solutions, um, and also as the government and, and um, uh, other, other folks to help support training programs. So you mentioned a training program that we're hosting, um, sponsoring next week um, up in, uh, in Iowa, in western Iowa. Uh, there are um, something that stuck with me was I met with the Standing Rock Sioux Council. I was invited to come and, and sat in the hot seat for a while and answered questions right. with council members. And the vice chairman was was asking me questions and making some some points. And one of the things he said was that projects like ours that come to the Upper Midwest, and he was talking about the former pipeline projects, uh, offer lots of opportunities for us and say all these things, but at the end of the day, the kinds of jobs they give us are picking up trash. Right. And those only last during construction and then they're gone. And that re- that's really stuck with me a lot. Um, as far as, you know, I, I can't say that he's wrong, the, right. but, but, uh, if, if I need an engineer for this job, I, my preference is to hire a native engineer. Right. Um, but if I can't find a native engineer because a native kid, or a girl mm-hmm. couldn't uh, get to college to get their engineering degree, um, then I can't choose a native engineer. So how do we fix that problem so that the jobs and opportunities for the, the tribes in that part of the world or any part of the world are the same regardless of the color of your skin, your background? And so how do we make those opportunities happen? So there's funding opportunities that we're exploring right now with state colleges so that mm-hmm. there are opportunities focused specifically on STEM and Native Americans. How can we make sure that these kids that are interested in these programs from, from middle school, high school, up to college, get those opportunities? And for those kids that aren't interested in STEM from a, I want to be an engineer, but I'm really good with working with my hands, or I like to build things, how do we set those folks up for success as well with trade schools? So white collar and blue collar opportunities right. and training um, and, and understanding that um, we, we all take things for granted sometimes. And we've had this conversation that with you some and with, with uh, some other folks we work with on the tribal outreach side, um, you know, we want to have this training and you take it for granted that that person doesn't have a car. Right. How does that person get to training? Or you get you you, you uh, that person doesn't have internet access to find out mm-hmm. about the training. Uh, that person um, can't afford to to do something that we all take for granted. And so, um, how do we set set uh, our our expectations at the right place and intersect at the right place, and then provide funding and opportunities at the right place for the right people? And so that's been the, that's been a challenge that I've felt very passionately about for a while. And um, luckily working with you and working with some other folks on our tribal outreach team, uh, we're, get real, we're really finding some some fruition to that that passion and right. really, really finding some ways to insert ourselves and insert uh, opportunities at the work face so that folks can, 
can realize that. Absolutely. And, you know, we're talking about jobs and preparing workforce development, you know, going through construction. It's like eleven and a half thousand jobs. Um, you know, you have almost twelve hundred jobs for the operation that that will be out there. And so this isn't just something that will end when construction yeah. is in place. So the relationship building now is so important for those long term benefits for communities that um, from the employment perspective, but also to be like really positive neighbors in terms of how, you know, um, emergency response, you True. know, uh, systems are being supported, uh, as well as as the school systems that we talked about, um, and just community activities. And um, I know that um, we have some priorities that we're addressing now, and I really appreciate your commitment to that. Well, I, I think it's a commitment that was set before I even come came on board. And again, because of my background and experience, it's just I've really embraced it and and I'm glad I have the opportunity to help affect some change um, you know I being being Choctaw um, and my brothers and I uh, uh, one one works for Devon he lives in uh, Edmond with his mm-hmm. family and the other one lives outside of DC um, you know, we we've we've had lots of opportunities that lots of people haven't and so how can we how can we uh, pour into uh, our tribe, and if not directly to our tribe, how can we pour into Native Americans mm-hmm. um, and, and other tribal nations? And so um, my children are adopted. Um, two of my ch- two of my three children are a Native American. Um, Lydia is with Cheyenne Arapaho, mm-hmm. and uh, Nora's Mississippi Band of Choctaws. Mm-hmm. So she's she's a, a, a cousin of ours. Um, a couple of a couple of generations removed because of of what happened with the Trail of Tears. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I want them to be set up for success as any parent wants for right. their children. And, um, it, it's just happenstance that God gave us them as our daughters. And so why, why would I not think the same of other tribes and Native Americans in the upper Midwest right. where we're doing the project? And so, um, I, I see there being lots of opportunities to shift, put that, put that, twig in the stream, that rock in the, in the creek or whatever you want to say that kind of shifts that, right. that opportunity. And if it's giving some money for a scholarship, that's, that's easy. If it's, if it's giving some money for that scholarship and, and hiring that person as an intern so that you, you can breathe, can pour into them more than just getting that education. Um, it's even more so. And if you can pay for their education hire them as an intern to pour into them to make sure that they understand the way you like to do things and you hire them on as a full-time employee, Mm -hmm. it's a win-win all the way. And if it's, if it's a tribal member in that part of the world, it's more than just being a good neighbor. It's really speaking into and, and, and being a part of the community, which is the tribes, the non-natives, everyone that lives in the upper Midwest in the footprint of our project. Right. It's really important. I mean, those relationships are important. The new standard that Summit Carbon Solutions is setting. And um, I'm really looking forward to continuing the journey as the project moves forward. I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. John Satterfield, do you uh, want to share the website with our listeners? Sure. www.summitcarbon.com is the website for the company. There's lots of information there. Um, and if you are interested in carbon capture and sequestration as a science, as an engineer, or, or just somebody interested in that, uh, you can go to the Department of Energy's website and search for that along with EPA's website. We hope to have you back for updates. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. thank you for joining us. Timber People is brought to you by the Possibilities Podcast Platform.